It's a combination of Bram Stoker's The Jewel of the Seven Stars and Arthur Conan Doyle's Lot Number 249, uh, along with uh, some mummy uh, imagery from uh, Mary, uh, Jane Webb's uh, uh, story, The Mummy, uh, and also William Shakespeare. Tonight joining us as Queen Tara from Jewel of the Seven Stars is Monica Maring. And Bruce Tinkle is the auctioneer. Within the sarcophagus was a body, manifestly of a woman, swathed with many wrappings of linen, as is usual with all mummies. From certain embroiderings thereon, I gathered that she was of high rank. Across the breast lay one hand, unwrapped. In the mummies which I had seen, the arms and hands are within the wrappings, and certain adornments of wood, shaped and painted to resemble arms and hands, lie outside the unwrapped body. But this hand was strange to see, for it was the real hand of her who lay enwrapped there, the arm projecting from the cerements, being of flesh, seemingly made as like marble in the process of embalming. I touched the hand and moved it, the arm being something flexible as a live arm, though stiff with long disuse. There was, too, an added wonder that on this ancient hand were no less than seven fingers, Sooth to say, it made me shudder, and my flesh creep to touch that hand that hath lain there undisturbed for so many thousands of years, and yet was like unto living flesh. Underneath the hand, as though guarded by it, was a huge jewel of ruby, the jewel of the seven stars. I stood gazing on it, as did those with me, as though it were that fabled head of the Gorgon Medusa with the snakes in her hair, whose sight struck into stone those who beheld. The stele, or record, which had its place low down on the western wall, was so remarkable that we examined it minutely. The inscription began, Terra, Queen of the Egypts, Daughter of Antep, Monarch of the North and the South, Daughter of the Sun, Queen of the Diadems. It then set out in full record the history of her life and reign. Queen Tara was of the 11th or Theban dynasty of Egyptian kings. She succeeded as the only child of her father, Antef, who had had his daughter taught magic, by which she had power over sleep and will. She had been an apt pupil and had gone further than her teachers. She had won secrets from nature in strange ways, and it was not without cause that she was inscribed on the stele as protector of the arts. Perhaps the most remarkable statement in the records, both on the stele and in the mural writings, was that Queen Tara had power to compel the gods. She had engraved upon a scroll and embedded within a ruby, carved like a scarab, and having seven stars of seven points, master words to compel all the gods, both of the upper and the underworlds. In the statement, it was plainly set forth that the hatred of the priests was, she knew, stored up for her, and that they would, after her death, try to suppress her name. A terrible revenge in Egyptian mythology, for without a name, no one can, after death, be introduced to the gods or have prayers said for him. Therefore, she had intended her resurrection to be after a long time and in a more northern land, under the constellation whose seven stars had ruled her birth. To this end, her hand was to be in the air, unwrapped, and in it the jewel of seven stars. The scroll of Queen Terra. The proof that resurrection can be accomplished.
number 249, selling once. Lot number 249, selling twice. Sold. Lot number 249 to Edward Billingham, Esquire. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is our greatest pleasure to present to you lot number 250. An extraordinary, an extraordinarily preserved fossil of the heretofore undocumented prehistoric species discovered on an isolated plateau in South America by an expedition led by Professor Challenger on a journey to the lost world. Of the dealings of Edward Bellingham with William Monkhouse Lee and of the cause of the great terror of Abercrombie Smith, it may be that no absolute and final judgment will ever be delivered. It is true that we have the full and clear narrative of Smith himself and such corroboration as he could look for, from Thomas Stiles, the servant, from the Reverend Plumtree Peterson, fellow of Olds, and from such other people as chance to gain some passing glance at this or that incident in a singular chain of events. Yet in the main, the story must rest upon Smith alone, and the most will think that it is more likely that one brain, however outwardly sane, has some subtle warp in its texture, some strange flaw in its workings, than that the path of nature has been overstepped in open day and so famed a center of learning and light as the University of Oxford. In a certain wing of what we will call Old College in Oxford, there is a corner turret of an exceeding great age. The heavy arch which spans the open door has bent downwards under the weight of its years. In the month of May, in the year 1884, three young men occupied the sets of rooms which opened onto the separate landings of the old stairway within. It was near midnight on a bright spring night, and medical student Abercrombie Smith lay back in his armchair his feet upon the fender, and his briar root pipe between his lips. Ah! There was a quick rattle of footsteps upon the stairs, and young Monkhouse Lee, half-dressed and as white as ashes, burst into his room. Come down, he gasped. Bellingham's ill. Abercrombie Smith followed him closely downstairs into the sitting room, which was beneath his own, and intent as he was upon the matter in hand, he could not but take an amazed glance around him as he crossed the threshold. It was such a chamber as he had never seen before, a museum rather than a study. In the center of this singular chamber was a large table littered over with papers, bottles, and the dried leaves of some graceful palm-like plant. These varied objects had all been heaped together in order to make room for a mummy case, which had been conveyed from the wall and laid across the front of the table. The mummy itself, a horribly discolored, withered thing like a charred head on a gnarled bush, was lying half out of the case, with its claw-like hand and bony forearm resting upon the table. Propped up against the sarcophagus was an old yellow scroll of papyrus, and in front of it sat the owner of the room, his head thrown back, his widely opened eyes directed in a horrified stare to the crocodile before him. My God, he's dying, cried Monkhouse Lee distractedly. Only a faint, I think, said the medical student. Just give me a hand with him. Yes, he'll be all right if we undo his collar and give him some water. What the deuce can have frightened him so? It's the mummy. The mummy? How then? I don't know. It's beastly and morbid. I wish he would drop it. It's the second fright he has given me. It was the same last winter. I found him just like this with that horrid thing in front of him. What does he want with the mummy, then? Oh, he's a crank, you know. It's his hobby. He knows more about these things than any man in England. But I wish he wouldn't. Ah, he's beginning to come to. A faint tinge of color began to steal back into Bellingham's ghastly cheeks, and his eyelids shivered like a sail after a calm. What's up? he asked. What do you chaps want? You've been shrieking out and making no end of a fuss, said Monkhouse Lee. If our neighbor here from above hadn't come down, I'm sure I don't know what I should have done with you. Ah, it's Abercrombie Smith, said Bellingham. How oh, very good of you to come in. What a fool I am. Oh my God, what a fool I am. Look here, drop it, cried Smith. Your nerves are all in a jangle. 
You must drop these little midnight games with mummies or you'll be going off your chump. I wonder, said Bellingham, whether you would be as cool as I am if you had seen... What then? Oh, nothing. I meant that I wonder if you could sit up at night with a mummy without trying your nerves. I have no doubt that you are quite right. I dare say that I have been taking it out of myself too much lately, but I am all right now. Please don't go, though. Just wait for a few minutes until I am quite myself. The room is very close, remarked Lee, throwing open a window and letting in the cool night air. It's balsamic resin, said Bellingham. It's the sacred plant, the plant of the priests. Do you know anything of Eastern languages, Smith? Nothing at all, not a word. The answer seemed to lift away from the Egyptologist's mind. By the way, he continued, how long was it from the time that you ran down until I came to my senses? Not long, so only four or five minutes. I thought it could not be very long, said he. But what a strange thing unconsciousness is. There is no measurement to it. I could not tell from my own sensations if it were seconds or weeks. Now that gentleman on the table was packed up in the days of the 11th dynasty some 40 centuries ago, and yet if he could find his tongue, he would tell us that this lapse of time has been but a closing of the eyes and a reopening of them. He is a singularly fine mummy smith. I don't know his name. You see the outer sarcophagus where the inscriptions is missing. Lot number 249 is all the title that he has now. You see it printed on his case. That was his number in the auction at which I picked him up. He's been a very pretty sort of fellow in his day, remarked Smith. Oh, he has been a giant. His mummy is six feet seven in length. Feel these great knotted bones, too. He would be a nasty fellow to tackle. Perhaps these very hands help to build the stones into the pyramids, suggested Monkhouse Lee, looking down with disgust in his eyes at the crooked, unclean talons. No fear. This fellow has been pickled in natron and looked after in the most approved style. They did not serve hobsmen in that fashion. Salt or bitumen was enough for them. It has been calculated that this sort of thing cost about 730 pounds in our money. Our friend was a noble at the least. What do you make of that small inscription near his feet, Smith? I told you that I know no Eastern tongue. Ah, so you did. It is the name of the embalmer, I take it. A very conscientious worker he must have been. He would. His eyes always came sliding round to his gruesome companion. You're not going, Lee, he cried. I'll do whatever you wish, Ned. Then I'll come down with you and have a shakedown on your sofa. Good night, Smith. I'm so sorry to have disturbed you with my foolishness. They shook hands, and in this strange way began the acquaintance between Edward Bellingham and Abercrombie Smith, an acquaintance which the latter, at least, had no desire to push further. Bellingham, however, appeared to have taken a fancy to his rough-spoken neighbor, and was, as Smith soon found, a man of wide reading with an extraordinary memory. Clever as he undoubtedly was, however, the medical student seemed to detect a dash of insanity in the man. He broke out at times into a high, inflated style of talk, which was in contrast to the simplicity of his life. It is a wonderful thing, he cried, to feel that one can command powers of good and of evil, a ministering angel or a demon of vengeance. And again, of Monkhouse Lee, he said, Lee is a good fellow, an honest fellow, but he is without strength or ambition. He would not make a fit partner for a man with a great enterprise. He would not make a fit partner for me. One habit Bellingham had developed of late, which Smith knew to be a frequent herald of a weakening mind. He appeared to be forever talking to himself. At late hours of the night, when there could be no visitor with him, Smith could still hear his voice beneath him in a low, muffled monologue, sunk almost to a whisper, and yet very audible in the silence. Sit here to those new babiona, ne de cartilit nedus, ostat aromicopis, Arona igno o si rugin tubatai. Sit here till o snil babiona, dene de cartilit nedus, ostat arome copus arona igno o si rugin tubatai. Sit here till o snil babiona, dene de cartilit nedus, ostat arome copus arona igno o si rugin tubatai. Magnolab, magnolab, draw day magnolab. Had Abercrombie Smith had any doubt as to his own ears, he had not to go far to find corroboration. Tom Stiles, the little wrinkled manservant who had looked after the wants of the lodgers in the turret for a longer time than any man's memory could carry him, was sorely put to it over the same matter. If you please, sir, said he as he tied you down the top chamber one morning, do you think that Mr. Bellingham is all right, sir? All right, Stiles? Yes, sir. Right in his head, sir. Why should he not be then? 
Well, I don't know, sir, his habits has changed of late. He's not the same man he used to be, although I make free to say that he was never quite one of my gentlemen, like yourself, sir. He's took to talking to himself something awful. I wonder it don't disturb you. I don't know what to make of him, sir. I don't know what business it is of your styles. Well, I takes an interest, Mr. Smith. It may be forward of me, but I can't help it. I feel sometimes as if I was mother and father to my young gentleman. It all falls on me when things go wrong and the relations come. But Mr. Bellingham, sir, I want to know what it is that walks about his room sometimes when he's out and when the door's locked on the outside. Later that night, Abercrombie Smith was startled by the sound of a firm, heavy footfall coming three steps at a time from below, and his old school friend, Jeffro Hasty, burst into the room. Have you heard about Long Norton? He gasped. What's that? He's been attacked. Attacked? Yes, just as he was turning out of the high street, and within a few hundred yards of the gate of Olds. But who? Ah, that's the rub. If you had said what, it would be more grammatical. Norton swears that it was not human, and indeed, from the scratches on his throat, I should be inclined to agree with him. What then, have we come down to spooks? Abercrombie Smith puffed his scientific contempt. Well, now I don't say that is quite the idea either. I'm inclined to think that if any showman has lost a great ape lately, and the brute is in these parts, a jury would find a true bill against it. Norton passes that way every night, you know, about the same hour. There's a tree that hangs low over the path, the big elm from Rainey's garden. Norton thinks the thing dropped on him out of the tree. Anyhow, he was nearly strangled by two arms, which he says were as strong and as thin as steel bands. He saw nothing, only those beastly arms that tightened and tightened on him. He yelled his head nearly off, and a couple of jets came running, and the thing went over the wall like a cat. He never got a fair sight of it the whole time. A grotter, most likely, said Smith. Very likely. Norton says not, but we don't mind what he says. The garroter had long nails and was pretty smart at swinging himself over walls. By the way, your beautiful neighbor Bellingham would be pleased if he heard about it. He had a grudge against Norton. And he's not a man, from what I know of him, to forget his little debts. Be careful of him, Smith. There's something damnable about him, something reptilian. My gorge always rises at him. I should put him down as a man with secret vices, an evil liver. He's no fool, though. For ten days, the medical student confined himself so closely to his studies that he neither saw nor heard anything of either of the men beneath him. One afternoon, however, he was descending the stairs when, just as he was passing it, Bellion's door flew open, and young Monkhouse Lee came up with his eyes sparkling and a dark flush of anger upon his olive cheeks. Close at his heels followed Bellingham, his most unpleasant and unhealthy face all quivering with malignant passion. You fool, he hissed. You'll be sorry. Very likely, cried the other. Mind what I say. It's off. I won't hear of it. You promised anyhow. Oh, I'll keep that. I won't speak. But I'd rather little Eva was in her grave. Once for all, it's off. She'll do what I say. We don't want to see you again. On the evening following this quarrel between Ever Bellingham and William Monkhouse Lee, Smith shut up his books at a quarter past eight, the hour when, twice a week, he usually started for the house of his friend, Dr. Plumtree Peterson. As he was leaving his room, however, his eyes chanced to fall upon one of the books which Bellingham had lent him, and his conscience pricked him for not having returned it. However repellent the man might be, he should not be treated with discourtesy. Taking the book, he walked downstairs and knocked at his neighbor's door. There was no answer, but on turning the handle, he found that it was unlocked. Pleased at the thought of avoiding an interview, Smith stepped inside and placed the book with his card upon the table. The lamp was turned half down, but Smith could still see the details of the room plainly enough. The animal-headed gods, the hanging crocodile, and the table littered over with papers and dried leaves. The mummy case stood upright against the wall, but the mummy itself was missing. There was no sign of any second occupant in the room. The spiral stair was as black as pitch, and Smith was slowly making his way down his irregular steps when he was suddenly conscious that something had passed him in the darkness. There was a faint sound, a whiff of air, a light brushing past his elbow, but so slight that he could scarcely be certain of it. Is that you, Stiles? he shouted. There was no answer, and all was still behind him. It must have been a sudden gust of air, for there were crannies and cracks in the old turret, and yet he could almost have sworn that he had heard a footfall by his very side. He had emerged into the quadrangle, still turning the matter over in his head, when a man came running swiftly across the smooth, cropped lawn. Is that you, Smith? Hello, Hasty. For God's sake, come at once. Young Lee is drowned. 
Here's Harrington of King's with the news. The doctor is out. You'll do, but come along at once. There may be life in him. And if you brandy, no, I'll bring some. There's a flask on my table. Smith bounded up the stairs, taking three at a time, seized the flask and was rushing down with it when, as he passed Bellingham's door, his eyes fell upon something which left him gasping and staring upon the landing. The door, which he had closed behind him, was now open, and right in front of him, with the lamplight shining upon it, was the mummy case. Three minutes ago it had been empty. He could swear to that. Now it framed the lank body of its horrible occupant, which stood grim and stark, with his black shriveled face towards the door. The form was lifeless and inert, but it seemed to Smith as he gazed that there still lingered a lurid spark of vitality, some faint sign of consciousness in the little eyes which lurked in the depths of the hollow sockets. So astounded and shaken was he that he had forgotten his errand and was still staring at the lean sunken figure when the voice of his friend below recalled him to himself. Come on, Smith, it's life and death, you know. Neck and neck, they dashed through the darkness and did not pull up until, panting and spent, they had reached the little cottage by the river. Young Lee, limp and dripping like a broken water plant, lay stretched upon the sofa, the green scum of the river upon his black hair and a fringe of white foam upon his leaded hued lips. Beside him knelt his fellow student, Harrington, and endeavoring to chafe some warmth back into his rigid limbs. I think there's life in him, said Smith, with his hand to the lad's side. Put your watch glass to his lips. Yes, there's dimming on it. You take one arm, Hasty. Now work it as I do, and we'll soon pull him around. For ten minutes they worked in silence, inflating and depressing the chest of the unconscious man. At the end of that time, a shiver ran through his body, his limbs trembled, and he opened his eyes. The three students burst out into an irrepressible cheer. What's up? Monkowski gasped. I've been in the water. Ah, uh, yes, I remember. A look of fear came into his eyes, and he sank his face into his hands. How did you fall in? I didn't fall in. How then? I was thrown in. I was standing by the bank when something from behind picked me up like a feather and hurled me in. I heard nothing and I saw nothing, but I know what it was for all that. And so do I, whispered Smith. Lee looked up with a quick glance of surprise. You've learned then, he said. Yes, answered Smith, and I begin to think that I shall take heed. Abercrombie Smith crossed the quadrangle to his corner turret with a strong feeling of repulsion for his chambers and their associations. What had been a dim suspicion, a vague, fantastic conjecture, had suddenly stood out and took form in his mind as a grim fact, a thing not to be denied. And yet how monstrous it was, how unheard of, how entirely beyond all bounds of human experience. And yet he could swear that Bellingham was a murderer at heart, and that he wielded a weapon such as no man had ever used in all the grim history of crime. He observed as he crossed over the lawn that the light was still shining in Bellingham's window, and as he passed up the staircase, the door opened and the man himself looked out at him, like some bloated spider fresh from the weaving of his poisonous web. Good evening, said he. Won't you come in? No! No? You're as busy as ever? I wanted to ask you about Lee. I was sorry to hear that there was a rumor that something was amiss with him. You'll be sorrier still to hear that Monkhouse Lee is doing very well and is out of all danger. Your hellish tricks have not come off this time. Oh, you needn't try to brazen it out. I know all about it. You're mad. What do you mean? You assert that I had anything to do with Lee's accident? Yes, you and that bag of bones behind you. You worked it between you. I tell you what it is, Master B. They have given up burning folk like you, but we still keep a hangman. And by George, if any man in this college beats his death while you are here, I'll have you up. And if you don't swing for it, it won't be my fault. You are a raving lunatic. All right, you just remember what I say, for you'll find that I'll be better than my word. The door slammed and Smith went fuming up to his chamber, where he spent half the night in smoking his old briar and brooding over the strange events of the evening. All the following day, Smith stuck fast to his work. But in the evening, he determined to pay the visit to his friend, Dr. Peterson, upon which he had started the night before. A good walk and a friendly chat would be welcome to his jangled nerves. Bellingham's door was shut as he passed, but glancing back when he was some distance from the turret, he could see his neighbor's head at the window, outlined against the lamplight, his face pressed apparently against the glass as he gazed out into the darkness. It was a blessing to be away from all contact with him, if but for a few hours, and Smith stepped out briskly and breathed the soft spring air into his lungs. The half moon lay in the west between two gothic pinnacles, and light fleecy clouds lifted driftly across the sky as they parted. The constellation of the seven stars, which had once ruled Queen Terra's birth centuries before, now burned again with a lustrous fire. Meanwhile, the same silvered beams of moon now shone upon the mummy of Queen Terra herself in the British Museum. 
who once more drew in the breath of life. Now all the one half world nature seems dead, and wicked dreams abuse the curtained sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder. With his sentinel, the wolf who howls. His watch thus strides with Tarquin's ravishing stride toward his design, moves like a ghost. led to his friend's house, and Smith did not meet a single soul upon his way. He walked briskly along until he came to the avenue gate, which opened into the long gravel drive leading up to Farlingford. In front of him, he could see the cozy red light of the windows glimmering through the foliage. He stood with his hand upon the iron latch of the swinging gate, and he glanced back at the road along which he had come. Something was coming swiftly down it. It moved in the shadow of the hedge, silently and furtively, a dark, crouching figure, dimly visible against the black background. Even as he gazed at it, it had lessened its distance by twenty paces and was fast closing upon him. Out of the darkness, he had a glimpse of a scraggy neck and of two eyes will ever haunt him in his dreams. He turned, and with a cry of terror, he ran for his life up the avenue. There were the red lights, the signals of safety, almost within a stone's throw of him. He was a famous runner, but never had he run as he ran that night. The heavy gate had swung in place behind him, but he heard it dash open again before his pursuer. As he rushed madly and wildly through the night, he could hear a swift dry patter behind him, and could see, as he threw back a glance, that the star was bounding like a tiger at his heels, with blazing eyes and one stringy arm outthrown. Thank God the door was ajar. Nearer yet sounded the clatter from behind. He heard a horse gurgling at his very shoulder. He heard the dry, bony fingers rattle as it drew them forth. He felt its tremendous grip. With a shriek, he slammed himself against the door, slammed and bolted it behind him, and sank half fainting onto the hall chair. My goodness, Smith, what's the matter? cried Peterson, appearing at the door of his study. Give me some brandy. You need it, said Peterson, appearing as his visitor drank off what he had poured out from. My man, you are as white as a cheese. Smith laid down his glass, took a deep breath, and rose up. I am my own man again now, said he, but with your leave, Peterson, I will sleep here tonight, for I don't think that I could face that road again except by daylight. It's weak, I know, but I can't help it. Dr. Peterson looked at his visitor with a very questioning eye. Of course you shall sleep here if you wish. I'll tell Mrs. Verney to make up the spare bed. Where are you off to now? Come down with me to the window that looks over your door. I want you to see what I have seen. They went up to the upper window of the hall whence they could look down upon the approach to the house. There, the drive and the fields on either side lay quiet and still, bathed in the peaceful moonlight. Oh, really, Smith, said his companion, it is well that I know you to be an abstemious man. What in the world can have frightened you? I will tell you presently, but where can it have gone? Oh, now, look, look, see the curve of the road just beyond your gate. Yes, I see. You needn't pinch my arm off. I saw someone pass. I should say a man, rather thin, apparently, and tall. Very tall. But what of him? And what of yourself? You're still shaking like an aspen leaf. I've been within hand grip of the devil, that's all, said he. But come down with me to your study, and I shall tell you the whole story. They did so. Under the cheery lamplight, with a glass of wine on the table beside him, and the portly form of his florid friend and face in front, he narrated in their order all the events, great and small, which had formed so singular a chain of from the night in which he had found Bellingham fainting in front of the mummy case 
until this horrid experience of an hour ago. There now, said he as he continued, that's the whole black business. It is monstrous and incredible, but it is true. Dr. Plumpley Peterson sat for some time in silence with a very puzzled expression upon his face. I've never heard of such a thing in my life. Never, he said at last. You've told me the facts. Now tell me your inferences. You can draw your own, but I should like to hear yours. You have thought over the matter, and I have not. Well, it must be a little vague in detail, but the main points seem to me to be clear enough. This fellow Bellingham in his Eastern studies has got hold of some infernal secret by which a mummy, or possibly only this particular mummy, can be temporarily brought to life. He was trying this disgusting business on the night when he fainted. Evidently, the sight of the preacher moving had shaken his nerve, even though he had expected it. You will remember that almost the first words he said were to call out upon himself as a fool. Well, he got more hardened afterwards and was able to carry the matter through without fainting. The vitality which he could put into it was evidently only a passing thing, for I've seen it continually in this case as dead as this table. He has some elaborate process, I fancy, by which he brings the thing to pass. Having done it, he naturally bethought him that he might use the creature as an agent. It has intelligence and it has strength. For some purpose he took Lee into his confidence, but Lee, like a decent Christian, would have nothing to do with such a business. Then they had a row, and Lee vowed that he would tell his sister Eva of Bellingham's true character, for they were engaged to be married. Bellingham's game was to prevent him, and he nearly managed it by setting this creature of his on his track. He had already tried his powers upon another man, Norton, for whom he had a grudge. It is the merest chance that he has not two murders upon his soul. Then when I taxed him with the matter, he had the strongest reasons for wishing to get me out of the way before I could convey my knowledge to anyone else. I've had a narrow shave, Peterson, and it is mere luck that you didn't find me on your doorstep in the morning. I'm not a nervous man as a rule, and I never thought to have the fear of death put upon me as it was tonight. My dear boy, you take the matter too seriously, said his companion. Your nerves are out of order with your work, and you make too much of it. How can such a thing as this drive about the streets of Oxford, even at night, without being seen? It has been seen. There is quite a scare in the town about an escape mate, as they imagine the creature to be. It is the talk of the place. Well, it's a striking chain of events, and yet, my dear fellow, you must allow that each incident in itself is capable of a more natural explanation. What, even my adventure of tonight? Certainly. You come out with your nerves all unstrung and your head full of this theory of yours. Some gaunt, half famished tramp steals after you, and seeing you run is emboldened to pursue you. Your fears and imagination do the rest. It won't do, Peterson. It won't do. And again, in the instance of your finding the mummy case empty, and then a few moments later with an occupant, you know that it was lamplight, that the lamp was turned half down, and that you had no special reason to look hard at the case. It is quite possible that you may have overlooked the creature in the first instance. No, no, it is out of the question. And that Lee may have fallen into the river, and Norton be garroted. It is certainly a formidable indictment that you have against Bellingham, but if you were to place it before a police magistrate, he would simply laugh in your face. I know he would. That is why I mean to take the matter in my own hands. Eh? Yes, I feel that a public duty rests upon me. And besides, I must do it for my own safety unless I choose to allow myself to be hunted by this beast out of the college. And that would be a little too evil. I've quite made up my mind what I shall do. And first of all, may I use your paper and pens for an hour? No, certainly. You will find all that you want upon that side table. Abercrombie Smith sat down before a sheet of fool's cap, and for an hour and then for a second hour, his pen traveled swiftly over it. At last, with an exclamation of satisfaction, he sprang to his feet, gathered his papers up into order, and laid the last one upon Peterson's desk. Kindly sign this as a witness, he said. A witness of what? Of my signature and of the date. The date is the most important. Why, Peterson, my life might hang upon it. My dear Smith, you are talking wildly. Let me beg you to go to bed. On the contrary, I have never spoken so deliberately in my life, and I will promise to go to the bed the moment you have signed it. But what is it? It is a statement of all I have been telling you tonight. I wish you to witness it. Certainly, said Peterson, signing his name under that of his companion. There you are. But what is the idea? You will kindly retain it and produce it in case I am arrested. Arrested? For what? For murder. Amid the grotesque shadows thrown back from the days that had passed, Abercrombie Smith once more ascended the stairs of the old turret, opened Bellingham's door, and stepped in. Bellingham was seated behind his table, writing. Beside him, among his litter of strange possessions, towered the mummy case, with its sale number 249 still stuck upon its front, and its hideous occupant stiff and stark within it. Smith looked very deliberately around him, stepped across to the room, and Striking a match, he set the fireplace alight. Bellingham sat staring with amazement and rage upon his bloated face. Well, really now, you make yourself at home, he gasped. Smith sat himself deliberately down, took out his watch, and placed it on the table. 
took out a revolver, cocked it, and laid it in his lap. Then he withdrew a long amputating knife and held it up before Bellingham. Now then, said he, just get to work and cut up that mummy. Oh, is that it, said Bellingham with a sneer. Yes, that is it. They tell me that the law can't touch you, but I have a law that will set matters straight. If in five minutes you have not set to work, I swear by the God who made me that I will put a bullet through your brain. You would murder me? Yes, and for what? To stop your mischief. One minute has gone, but what have I done? I know and you know, this is mere bullying. Two minutes are gone, but you must give reasons. You are a madman, a dangerous madman. Why should I destroy my own property? It is a valuable mummy. You must cut it up and you must burn it. I will do no such thing. Four minutes are gone. Smith took up the pistol and he looked towards Bellingham with an inexorable face. As the second hand stole round, he raised his hand and the finger twitched upon the trigger. There, there, I'll do it, screamed Bellingham. In frantic case, he caught up the knife and he hacked at the figure of the mummy. The creature crackled and snapped under every step of the king's blade. A thick yellow dust rose up from it. Spices and dried essences rained down upon the floor. Suddenly, with a rending crack, his backbone snapped asunder, and it fell, a brown heap of sprawling limbs upon the floor. Now into the fire. The flames leaped and roared as the dried and tinder-like debris was piled upon it. Fat smoke oozed out from the fire, and a heavy smell of burned resin and singed hair filled the air. In a quarter of an hour, a few charred and brittle sticks were all that was left of lot number 249. Perhaps that will satisfy you, snarled Bellium. No, I must make a clean sweep of all your materials. We must have no more devil's tricks. In with all these leaves, they may have something to do with it. And what now, asked Bellingham, when the leaves also had been added to the blaze. Now the roll of papyrus which you had on the table that night. It is in that box, I think. No, no, shouted Bellium. Don't burn that. Why, man, you don't know what you do. It is unique. It contains wisdom which is nowhere else to be found. Out with it. But look here, Smith. You can't really mean it. I'll share the knowledge with you. I'll teach you all that is in it. Or stay. Let me only copy it before you burn it. Smith stepped forward and grabs the box. And, taking out the yellow curled roll of paper, he threw it into the fire and pressed it down with his heel. Bellingham screamed and grabbed at it. But Smith pushed him back and stood over it until it was reduced to a formless gray ash. Now, Master B, said he, I think I've pretty well drawn your teeth. You'll hear from me again if you return to your old tricks. And it's now good morning, for I must go back to my studies. And such is the narrative of Abercrombie Smith as to the singular events which occurred in Old College, Oxford, in the spring of 84, as Bellingham left the university immediately afterwards and was last heard of in the Sudan, there is no one who can contradict his statement, but the wisdom of men is small, and the ways of nature are strange, and who shall put a bound to, dark, to the dark things which may be found by those who seek for them? It was the 3rd of November, 1884, when we entered the mummy pit for the second time. The first thing noticeable was the emptiness of the place. Despite all its magnificent adornment, the tomb was made an absence, it was made a desolation by the absence of the great sarcophagus among the Ushaktu figures. However, it was made more infinitely desolate still by the shrouded figure of the mummy of Queen Terra herself, who now stood where the great sarcophagus had once stood. Beside her lay, in the strange contorted attitudes of violent death, three of our party who had deserted. Their hands and necks were smeared with blood which had burst from mouth and nose and eyes. On the throats of each were the marks, now blackening of a hand of seven fingers. I drew close in awe, for across the breast of the mummified queen lay a hand of seven fingers, ivory white, the wrist only showing a scar like a jagged red line from which seemed to depend drops of blood. It was as though the body had bled after death. The jagged ends of the broken wrist of this spiritualized corpse were rough with the clotted blood. Through this, 
The white bone sticking out looked like the matrix of opal. The blood had streamed down and stained her wrappings as with rust. Was it strange then that we had a superstitious feeling with regard to the dead Queen Terra and all belonging to her? Now I can drink hot blood and do such bitter business as the day would quake to look on. The Jewel of the Seven Stars, lot number 249, by Bram Stoker and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He's a cigar face in the Toxic Venture movies, but he had created this sculpture, and uh, and my other, another friend, uh, M. W. Ambrose, had created uh, this sculpture for Bellingham Study. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.